as anybody would, I think, ascertain in listening to our prayers that we prayed already this morning, we are in uh, very rough times. And we really, in many ways, are always in rough times. I think from the time I started at this church, I think the first crisis we faced was Katrina. And uh, I was with FEMA and went down there and, and uh, helped with after that. And it's, it doesn't seem like it's one thing after another in the world as we, as we look at it. It hasn't always been that way. There's always been wars and, and things, but it, it, it does seem to be a, a, an accelerating world that we live in. These, I, I'm often asked by people, Ken, are, are, do you think we're in the last times? Do you think we're in the last days? And well, of course I believe we are. We are in the last days. They've been 2,000 years of them, but from the time of Jesus' uh, crucifixion and ascension to heaven until the day of his return, these are called the last days. Eschat uh, uh, theologically, that is called eschatology, the study of the last time things. And these are eschatological times. Uh, that's, that's about all the big words I'm going to be using today because it's about all I can understand. But you, you get my point. Uh, these are difficult times that we, that, we, that we live in. And I know in the 20 years I've been here, it has been persistent that there's always been something. The text of scripture that we are looking today is an eschatological end times piece of scripture. But we're not going to go to the book of, uh, of, of uh, uh, Revelation to find it or first or second Thessalonians or back in the prophets. We're going to stay right where we're at on the road on the way to Jerusalem with Jesus Christ. Last week, Caleb mentioned that Jesus, the events of Zacchaeus, who was converted by Christ and met him, repented of his sins, happened in a town called Jericho. And we are still in Jericho today, although we are leaving it. We are with Jesus and he is on a journey to Jerusalem where he knows that he will face the cross and death and resurrection. And he's been warning and talking to his disciples about it probably for weeks since Luke chapter 9, at least, and, uh, and yet none of them are really getting it. We're going to talk about that this morning, and I'd like for you to open your Bibles, if you would, to uh, the, the book of Luke, uh, chapter 19. And I've titled my uh, words today, The Magnificent Opportunity, and I hope that that comes out as I'm speaking, and if I'm wrong about that, I hope the Holy Spirit corrects it and makes it all right. So read along uh, with me on Luke chapter 19, beginning in verse 11. While they were listening to these things, Jesus went on to tell a parable because he was near Jerusalem and they supposed that the kingdom of God was going to appear immediately. So he said, a nobleman went to a distant country to receive a kingdom for himself and then return. And he called 10 of his slaves and gave them 10 minas and said to them, do business with this until I come back. But his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him saying, we do not want this man to reign over us. When he returned after receiving the kingdom, he ordered that those, these slaves to whom he had uh, given the money be called to him so that he might know what business they had done. The first appeared saying, Master, your mina has made ten minas more. And he said to him, Well done, good slave, because you've been faithful in a very little thing. You are to be in authority over ten cities. The second came and said, your mina master has made five minas. And he said to him also, and you are to be over five cities. Another came saying, master, here is your mina, which I kept put away in a handkerchief. For I was afraid of you because you're an exacting man and you uh, take up what you did not lay down and you reap what you did not sow. The master said to him, by your own words, I will judge you worthless slave. 
Did you know that I'm an exacting man, taking up what I did not lay down and reaping what I did not sow? Then why didn't you put my money in the bank? And having come, I would have collected it with interest. Then he said to the bystanders, take the mina away from him, give it to the one who has the ten minas. They said to him, Master, he has ten minas already. I tell you that to everyone who has, more shall be given. But from the one who does not have, even what he does have shall be taken away. But these enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them, bring them here and slay them in my presence. After he had said these things, he was going ahead, going up to Jerusalem. This is God's word to us today. Gracious King, we ask you, as you have spoken these words for a purpose, now you have spoken them to us this morning for a purpose. But with our hearts, your purposes, we fear, are not always, are not always successful. We, we, we throw other things into the mix. We struggle with trusting you to apply the word in a unique and special way to each person. Would you, um, by the work of your Holy Spirit, would you help us this morning that, we would, that that wouldn't happen? That your very Spirit at work in every human being, every heart in this room, would see that the story, that the meaning, that the proper interpretation of this parable that you told uh, would would be applied properly to our lives for we do intend to follow you or at least meet you and know you and uh, we do desire you blessed king we ask for this this morning uh, in your name and by your blood amen the return of jesus christ and the events that go along with its return is one of the greatest subjects of scorn that you'll find in the world around you. The mere suggestion that our world may be in an eschatological time can bring derision and mockery from everyone from the press to movies, to television, to talk shows online, uh, the jeering, mocking concept that possibly God might have any business at all judging this world. And that Jesus Christ himself really is a human being who wherever he is, he is going to come back. That will bring uh, howls of, of derision and, and, and of mockery. Um, and yet that's what Jesus is completely talking about this morning. It's what he's talked about all the time. He is coming back. The big idea that we're going to cover today is this. We have the magnificent opportunity of representing Jesus in his absence by uh, extending an invitation to everyone to be saved by him and avoid judgment. Our magnificent opportunity that we have is to represent Jesus Christ in his absence, serve him loyally, and to, in whatever ways we can, invite those around us in the world to escape the judgment that will occur at his return. That is our big opportunity. So let's go, let's work through this thing and then we will, we will apply it to our lives. The first thing I see here is that there's a very significant setting uh, of this parable. While they were listening to these things, Jesus went on to tell a parable because he was near Jerusalem and they supposed that the kingdom was going to appear immediately. Hi, Natalia. So um, we have uh, the conditions behind it and, and here's what it is. The place is Jericho. And uh, Jericho is about 15 or 16 miles away from Jerusalem, heading east, uh, down toward the nation of, of Jordan. And uh, that's where he was on his way up to Jerusalem. And uh, the significance of it is that Jericho um, is kind of the last big stop before you head up to Jerusalem from this area. He would traveled through that city many, many times as a boy and as he grew up, and he was in the city of Jericho. The purpose of telling the parable was to refute a false notion. 
And the notion was that simply a man as tremendous and wonderful and powerful as Jesus Christ, simply him showing up in Jerusalem will immediately bring in the kingdom of God. And they were following him, assuming that was true. It didn't matter that he had told his disciples, uh, listen to this and let your ears let this. And I think at one point he says, let this sink into your ears. The Son of Man is going to go to Jerusalem and be betrayed, handed over to the Gentiles, uh, nailed on, onto a cross, die, raised from the dead. He, he did, they, they didn't compute with any of that. They really thought he was on his way to overturn the government of Rome, the political environment of Jerusalem, and to set up a new uh, kingdom. If you look at other places in the Gospels on this particular journey to, to Jerusalem, we have the disciples jockeying for position, wondering who's going to be in charge, who's going to be at the right, who's going to be at the left hand of Jesus. And it was very clear they thought they were headed for a, a, a kingdom here. And Jesus felt he needed to correct that. We often assume that a relationship with Jesus somehow gives us the right to presume to set up a kingdom. Simply being with him somehow, we figure, gives us a moral right to inflict our will and our judgment on the world around us and basically set up our kingdom. You see, we want to find ways to build this kingdom of God politically, militarily, culturally, striking against this thing, marching against that thing. We find ways to exert our will to bring about um, our kingdom because we want to find ways to do it without a cross. <laughs> we want the crown, but we don't listen to that part about dying and suffering and living in last days and needing Jesus on the earth to do it. How stupid it is every time Christians try politically to set up a Christian kingdom without Jesus being here, uh, having appeared yet on the earth. So he told this parable and here's what it is. He said, there's a nobleman who left to receive a kingdom. He traveled to a far, far country, uh, in, which meant, of course, that he would be gone a long time. And he was traveling to this country to receive a kingdom for himself. Now, what that means is he, he was traveling to a country with a more powerful king and a more powerful president, leader, whatever you want to call it, who controlled his kingdom. And he was going to be named the little king of this kingdom. In the Roman times, that would be called usually an ethnarch, a leader of, the ethnic, of, of an ethnic group. And the Jewish kings uh, established by Rome were ethnarchs. They were rulers of the Jews. It wasn't a geographical rulership. That would be, I think, a politarch, but an ethnarch. So they were going to, so anyway, this guy was going to go and receive a kingdom. He's going to be gone a long time. Before he went, this man, um, he selected 10 of his servants to conduct his business while he was away. This is important for us. He didn't just pick anybody and he didn't just find a financial advisor to manage his money or anything like that. He chose 10 of his servants. There's an exclusivity there, isn't there? You don't just choose any 10. He chose a specific 10 to entrust some money to a mina. I've heard a minus nine months wages and I've heard it's a day's wage. So you can kind of take your pick. I don't think it's that important. What's significant is that he entrusted one or was it one mina to each of these uh, to each of these servants of his? This isn't like another parable that Jesus told, where he gave a varying amount of gifts and money to his servants, and they invested and they and they you know made money off it or did this or that. Those were gifts that he gave to them. This is different. He's giving the same thing to each servant. Well, what we see as the story unfolds is what he's doing is setting up a type of internship. He's testing them. Because when he returns with the official designation of king, with all of the representation of this larger country, which would be Rome in their setting, he wanted to know who he could entrust the governance of various cities to. Now, by entrust, I mean mainly in this setting, collect taxes from to support the government. And, he, and so this is a type of internship that he set up for these 10 to test them in his absence. And he told them, do business 
with this mina that I've given you. The, the word is, is the word that we derive. It's, it's pragmataste. It, it, it's the word we get pragmatic from. Pra, be pragmatic with this. This is down to business. He, he's saying, uh, you, you know, make more money with this money that I've given you. I'm giving you each the same amount. Now that's a challenge. If you've given me 10 and, and given you five, and then I did, you know, really, really great, and you didn't do as well, you know, Natalia, then you go, well, wait a minute, Jesus, you gave Ken 10, and I only had five. But he gave all the same, because they were all being tested with the same, uh, starting out from the same place. So he said, do business with this while I'm away. And in the story, what that means is make money for me. Now, this is a concept all of Jesus' listeners would definitely understand because it was very common in those days to buy into a merchant or a shipment or a, a financial endeavor to get a percentage and a piece of the profits that would come to you from that. Make money for me. This whole story so far, before I go on, I want to tell you, it would be so recognizable by the people Jesus was speaking to. It sounds kind of funny to us. No election. Where's the democracy? What do you mean a far country? Here's how it is. These people, a couple of decades earlier, they had sent a delegation to Rome because of one of Herod's sons. He had three sons. And one of them named Archelaus, who you might remember from Jesus, the early years when he was returning from Egypt, Joseph was afraid to settle where that guy was in charge because he was cruel. He was a murderer. And Herod had left him everything, all the kingdom. And King Herod died, Herod the Great. And he had these three sons, uh, Philip, Antipas, and Archelaus. And, and Archelaus was going to take over everything. And he went to Rome to receive the whole kingdom, the ethnarch of Israel and the Jews. And before he left, I think he killed like 3,000 people or something, really exerting his will. Well, before he left, the Jews sent a delegation to Rome uh, after him, not on the same boat, I'm sure. <laughs> they sent a delegation to plead before Augustus Caesar, we don't want him as king. Caesar, Augustus, was actually quite a ruler and, and, and a very wise and, and powerful, smart guy. He, instead of giving the kingdom to Archelaus, he split it between Herod's three sons and made them ethnarchs in these smaller areas of, of, of Israel. Well, uh, uh, Archelaus made it back to Israel. He reigned for a few years, I think seven or eight years, caused so much trouble that he was finally deposed by Rome and spent out the rest of his life in southern France. So the citizens and the people that Jesus is speaking to would be very, very uh, well aware and understanding of the concept of this guy went to Rome to receive a kingdom and then he would come back and be the ruler. They would know all that that's about. But this takes a different turn because he returned this landowner, this, this, uh, this nobleman in the story. He returned, evaluated his servants and he judged his enemies. First, he returned and evaluated. He evaluated his servants, the 10 servants, based on their faithfulness to his business dealings while he was gone. Those who had invested wisely, uh, they were rewarded. They were commended, promoted. Uh, they, were, they did very well. And, and the one had, had turned that mina into 10, and one had turned his mina into five, and he's basically saying, good job. You know, you got something I like here. Here, have a cigar, relax. Okay, get out there and rule 10 cities. It was, a good, it was a good time for him. But there was another servant who came that had proved to be unfaithful. Unfaithful. It's interesting. It's not that he's called unsuccessful. It's not that he's called unprofitable. He's called unfaithful. There was a deeper relational aspect between the nobleman and his servants that was missing in this particular servant. He came before him and he said, I uh, was scared of you. Had a little dirty little hanky and took it out in front of the master and said, here is your mina intact. There it is. You see, I was afraid of you. I knew that you are a ruthless man and that you uh, pick up where you did not lay down. You reap where you did not sow. What that means is I know that you're a man who is not shy about taking a profit for things other people have worked for. That's how you are, and I know it, and I know you don't like losses, 
And that scared the heck out of me. So I took your mina and put it in a, and put it in a thing and, and maybe, I don't know, kept it under his bed or buried a hole in it or something. And he said, you stupid servant, I, unfaithless servant. I, you could have put it in the bank and at least got me interest. And then he took that one mina away from that servant, gave it to the one who made 10 because this is a master who wants to profit. So he took away what he had. He didn't take away him being a servant. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, then he threw him to hell because he was a bad servant. No, he remained a servant, remained in the household. I don't know what he was doing, pulling weeds or, you know, maybe he got transferred or something. He remained a servant. He was part of the household, but he did not experience the reward, the responsibility, uh, uh, the promotion, the commendation, the public commendation. He didn't get any of that. Instead, he was ashamed. Well, Jesus went on and told us the point of the parable. And if you're ever studying parables, I got to tell you, Luke is, is the guy you want to study. There's parables in all the scriptures, but Luke is really great. He always tells us why a parable is told. And then he makes it very clear when Jesus applies the parable and tells us what it means. And what's really great about that is, the, is the, the only way you can really goof up interpreting a parable is if you start inserting your own prior ideas about what Jesus must mean. But if you just read what it says, it's pretty clear. He told a parable because they thought they were going to get the kingdom right away. And then he told them a parable that was a story about a king being gone for a long time and his servants being evaluated when he came back for how they handled what he gave them. Jesus said in terms of explaining this parable, I tell you that to everyone who has more shall be given. But to the one who does not have even what he does have will be taken away. Those enemies of mine who didn't want me to reign over them, bring them here and slay them in my presence. And after he had said these things, he was going ahead, going up to Jerusalem. Take note of that. It had nothing to do with how many people followed Jesus, whether or not he would go to Jerusalem. He didn't need an army. He didn't need a crowd and he didn't need people on his side. He was going to Jerusalem because in fulfillment of prophecy, he knew he was going to arrive in the city on a specific day and be delivered over to die. At this point in time, the nation of Israel through its relig religious leaders had already formally rejected his Messiahship. That's important. It wasn't that he went to Jerusalem and had the big Jerusalem campaign hoping that they'd take him on. It wasn't like that at all. They had sent delegations from Jerusalem to evaluate his ministry, to listen to him, to test him by his miracles, by his speech and, and everything. And they had determined that everything he did was from Satan and that he was not a Messiah and that he did not fit the scholastic requirements and they had rejected him formally. He was a rejected leader making his way to Jerusalem where he would face his death. You know, we're fond of saying things like, well, on the Palm Sunday, if that crowd had received Jesus, the whole kingdom of God would have begun on earth right there. Everything would have been different. Um, yes and no. Yeah, if, Eve and, if Adam and Eve had not eaten the forbidden fruit, everything would really would be different, wouldn't it? But it wasn't, and, and it doesn't appear that God was surprised by what they did. Um, Israel hardly had a chance from the moment its leaders formally rejected him. And yet he was making his way to Jerusalem. We have the magnificent opportunity during this time between the appearances of Jesus Christ to represent him to extend his interests, not with a day's pay or nine months pay or however you wanna talk about that, but to represent him with the one thing that he has given each of us that knows Jesus. We've all got the same thing. We have different gifts, don't we? Some of us can do this and some can do that. I mean, one of the worst understandings of this parable that I read, actually it's in my own Bible. <laughs> it, was, it was written as a little inserted title of the, of the parable, it was faithfulness in money. <laughs> do you see anything in here that's trying to get me to be a better, I mean, I'm lost already if that's the, the thing. No, <laughs> yeah. This is about faithfulness in the absence of our king right now today. So, that's what this is about. And we have a magnificent opportunity now. And we will be judged 
by how we represent our king while he is away. I'm going to say a few things about that. But the resource you have and the resource that I have are all the same. And that can only be, it's not health, it's not talent, it can only be the gospel, the salvation that we have been given by God. Now, I don't just mean the theological four points of why it is that people can be saved from judgment and, and that, that, that is the gospel and it's wonderful, but um, that is how the gospel works. But the gospel is, the good news is, God has found a way to save the world. And he's already done it. With Christ's death and resurrection, the battle is all but over. And, and this is the gift that has been given to those who know Christ. And we've all been given this gift. And yet, we are supposed to use this gift. Not something else. I thought all I had to do was write down the date in my Bible that I became a Christian. And maybe carry that with me before the big pearly gates. And then when they are going to let me in, I can say, hey, on this day, I prayed the prayer and therefore I'm in, right? And of course, since I did follow Christ, since I did pray to him, I'm in. But the gospel is more than that. It is the salvation of God that has been entrusted with us to put to work while he is away. By what you do, by what you say, by how you live. By how you love those around you. It, it, it really comes down to that. It's not just a matter of, well, if you really want to get rewarded by Jesus, you need to order a hundred Bible tracts of the gospel, go stand on a corner, and keep handing those things out. And then you are really a busy bee for the kingdom. Not at all. You are to invest your entire life, all of your orientation around following Jesus Christ and extending his interests into the life of those in your family, your children, your grandchildren, your friends, your neighbors, your church. You are to constantly be speaking and doing in representation of your master, Jesus Christ. Sharing Christ, of course, but all that goes with that life, that is faithfulness. So that's the opportunity we have. Let me conclude by just sharing with you what I see as how we are to embrace that opportunity. It's one thing to have it. How do I put it to work? Okay, the first thing I see is that, and this deals with, with d different aspects of our, of our personalities, then the first thing has to do with my identity. I need to have an identity as a disciple of Jesus Christ. Now, I can be a good disciple who obeys Jesus, or I can be a bad disciple who is a lazy guy that doesn't do anything with it. Either way, I'm a disciple. I might be a failed disciple or a successful disciple, a faithless disciple or a faithful disciple. Um, I'll get to where that ends up for us. But either way, I am a servant of Jesus Christ because I received him by faith. And if you have ever received Jesus Christ, you are a servant of Jesus Christ. You are a disciple of Jesus Christ. The question before you, my friend, is not to try to determine whether you really followed Jesus or not, or whether you really believed in Jesus. Or, that's not, that's a waste of time. The question before you is what kind of servant are you in your master's absence? And if you have not received Jesus Christ, if you have not trusted in him, and you're with us today, thank you for being here, because this is what you need to hear. Today's the day then, receive Jesus Christ. Turn to him. Oh, there's no specific formula for what you can say. You can just say, save me, and you're saved. That's how he is. So the first thing I see is that we must bear an identity of being first and foremost disciples of Jesus Christ. And what, that, what I mean by that is you've got to convert. You've got to be a Christian. You gotta be in his household. You don't wanna be one of those citizens out there. You wanna be in his household. Okay, secondly is our calling. To be successful in this endeavor of, of uh, doing your master's business while he's gone means to acknowledge and to receive his calling. And his calling is rough. It's to center your entire life on Jesus Christ. It is to live for him. You're not earning your salvation. You're living out the life of salvation. It is to orient your life, your money, your time, everything around being 
obedient and sensitive to his leading in your life. It means one thing for me. It might mean another thing for you. You know, for me, it might mean to, to do what I do with my life as well as I can to serve my king with what he's given me, this salvation. Uh, for you, it might mean to be a millionaire and to use your money in a way that blesses the world around you and to extend the work of Jesus Christ. For one person here, it might mean to use that beautiful oratory you, skill you have of sharing Christ with the people and, and lovingly sharing to them the truth of the gospel and all that. That's really great. For some, it means being in constant touch with the people around you to care for their physical needs and to care for where they're lacking and what they need and, and constantly searching for great opportunities to let them know God loves you and I love you. If you ever want to hear about that love, I'm here. There's different ways it works, but it's extending the work of Christ. That's your calling. Third, I see, is to be very comfortable with your place of service. Your place of service. You see, God doesn't just save somebody so that, so that they can just go in a spiritual closet, uh, have devotions every morning, and then go about kind of the normal hoi polloi way with the citizens around them and, and, and wonder where God wants them to be. Let me give you a clue. Where God wants us to be is usually where we're at. Okay? God wants you to be a certain kind of person where you are at. And we are to represent Jesus and do these things that uh, I find in the world in, in the in the word here. We're to do it amidst a culture and a world that oftentimes hates Jesus Christ. That's where we're doing business. It's like opening up a <laughs> it's like opening up a, 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 a pork shop in the middle of a, of a nation or a country that doesn't eat pork or something crazy like that. That's probably a bad analogy, but you get what I mean. We're in a hostile environment and we are uh, in another kingdom now and in another place representing salvation and, and a king to a culture that often hates him. Now, you might say to yourself, well, Ken, I haven't seen anybody hating Jesus. I mean, there's, there's always kind of, you know, wackadoodles out there that try to go hate him. But even non-Christians admit what an incredible person Jesus is. What are you talking about? Well, I'm talking about using one of the most powerful militaries in the world to uh, go to a country of 40 million people. And try to destroy it by bombing hospitals and orphanages and uh, apartment complexes. You hate Jesus if you do something like that. You hate him. That's the place where we do our living as Christians. I'm talking about living in a world where we have a culture around us that basically feels okay about uh, letting our sons and our daughters go off and make living as uh, strippers and prostitutes and movie film people in the adult film industry and somehow feels like that's a, that's a great freedom of choice. That's hating Jesus. I'm talking about a world where we fight and, and, and march and do anything to preserve a right for an exercise of the abortion industry that is way beyond caring for children and for women's health. And we support it and continue to, as a culture, make it a big deal. And that's hating Jesus. So my point in saying all this is that we are ministering and representing Jesus in a world that hates Jesus. You know, if we go through life and the world always seems to get along with us and feel great about us, we need to, we need to kind of stop and say, I know this is a world that hates Jesus, or at least it's full of a lot of people that do. That's how it was for the people that received the mina. They were doing business successfully, faithfully, in a hostile place because those citizens hated that king. That's what the text actually says. They hated this ruler that was going to Rome to receive a kingdom. Okay, I see also in terms of living this kind of a life, it has to do with our motivation. Our motivation must be love for Jesus along with a desire for his reward and commendation. Love for Jesus. And if you don't feel very loving toward Jesus that day, hey, you know what? It's not a bad thing to just want to be commended and rewarded by him on his return. Because we don't always feel the same every day, do we? It's okay to serve Jesus out of a desire for reward. I know that goes against us. We, we think, oh, I don't want to get into salvation by works. Well, I don't want you to either. 
And we go, oh, I don't want to be a person that says he doesn't love Jesus. Well, I don't want to be that person either. But it's really okay, like Paul, who said, I do not want to be found wanting. And I don't want to run this race in vain. I want the prize. I want the reward. Or the Apostle John, who said, let us live good lives so that when he appears, we will not shrink at his appearance. I mean, there is a desire. And it's good to want to please Jesus and be commended when he returns. C.S. Lewis said, um, he, he said, indeed, if we consider the unblushing promises of reward and the staggering nature of the rewards promised in the Gospels, it would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us we are too easily pleased it is okay to want to stand before jesus and have him say well done i gave you this gift of salvation i asked you to invest it and work with it in this short time on earth that you had and look at what you accomplished faithless servant and finally I believe that living this kind of a life as a servant of Christ during this time involves a definite change and, and an adopting of responsibility. You see, while Jesus is away, we are responsible to appeal to, you know, that surrounding culture that I just said all those bad things about. <laughs> we are to love them and appeal to them to make friends with the king while he is away so that when he returns, they will be found in his household as servants instead of his enemies who have hated him and will be judged. So at the end of the day, what I find theologically from this is that there's really three ways this thing ends for us. Commendation, rebuke and loss, or judgment. And by that, I mean, I'm saying a nice way, I'm saying execution, and I'm just saying it in a nicer way. Commendation and praise from Jesus Christ at his return. Shame and humiliation and loss of reward as you enter his kingdom. But nonetheless, recognize, and you've got to get that right with him, that you squandered what he gave you during this short life. The only time in eternal history when you can actually live by faith, and you blew it. And then finally, and tragically, the responsibility we have that some, perhaps many, many, many at his return, will experience judgment and death and execution for they have been enemies of the king and they have not become his friends uh, while they had the chance. Gracious God, our responsibility is weighty and huge. And we don't recognize it and speak of it in a light way. Forgive us if we do. We don't take it lightly that you would say something as drastic as bring out those enemies of mine and slay them in my presence. We don't take that lightly. We're not going to soft sell it or water it down because you said it. And you've given us something to do about it. It's to extend the love and grace of your kingdom in every way we can into this world while we can. We pray for your grace, the power of your spirit, that we would do just that. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen.